Hey, everybody. There we go. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Emily, for that introduction. It's far more generous than I deserve. Um, we're here today to wrap up uh, our Knights in Armor exhibition, um, and I'm joined by uh, my fighting partner and uh, one of my star students, Lorraine Mattis. Um, we've had a chance throughout the, the run of the exhibition, uh, we've been honored to be up here several times demonstrating the function and design of armor, answering all of those great questions. How much did armor weigh? How do you sword fight? What was the job of a knight on the battlefield? All those great kind of questions uh, that we were talking about today. But like when we get to, uh, to the end of one of our educational presentations at a school, um, we sort of come to what I call the so what moment. Um, the, the moment where we kind of have to ask ourselves, does all this stuff still have anything to do with us today? Or is this all just colorful, interesting historical trivia that when the doors to the gallery are locked up means nothing to us anymore? So what I want to do today is take a, a little bit of time, not so much to answer, although we'll certainly have, I'm sure, some time for questions afterwards, uh, not so much to answer all of the material questions about arms and armor and knights, but to talk a little bit about the ideals of chivalry that went along with them, that were embodied uh, in, uh, that are embodied in the image of a knight in armor uh, that, that still speaks to us today, um, and have a little bit of a conversation, perhaps just between us, although I certainly uh, am always interested in hearing what uh, other people have to say on these, on these topics, have a little bit of a conversation about whether these ideals still matter to us today, whether they have anything to say to us as we answer the question, so what? Okay. Um, so I think uh, Emily gave me plenty of introduction, uh, but let me, let me introduce uh, my, uh, my colleague, uh, Lorene, who specifically I wanted to have here today um, to, to speak both as a woman and as an educator. Alrighty. So I'm very, very excited to be here today, by the way. Thank you for having us. Um, so, you know, when I first picked up a longsword, I thought, oh, this will be a fun little hobby. This will be a nice way to spend a Wednesday. Um, no, I actually, what I didn't realize is that I was taking, I was starting a philosophical and historical journey down the road of chivalry. Um, when Scott first told me, oh, this is what I'm going to title a talk, chivalry today, or the so what factor, I immediately thought of my students. Um, you know, I substitute for a lot of English classes, and one of the biggest questions I get from them is often, Mrs. Mattis, why do I have to do this? Why are we reading the crucible? It is so boring, Mrs. Mattis. Why? <laughs> or, you know, why are we listening to it? Why are we reading all this Shakespeare stuff? Why don't they just translate it into modern English? Why? Um, you know, so in some of it is just frustration and tiredness. But I'm also, I'm very proud of them for asking that question. Because if we spend our time looking into something and reading into something, it's important that we ask why we're doing it. That it's not just, that we're not simply doing it for the experience of doing something. Um, so some of you today might have come along to support a spouse or a boyfriend or a girlfriend, you know, or a parent or a child. Um, and you might be sitting there kind of going, yeah, why? What's, what's the big deal with all this chivalry stuff? Um, so this is kind of dedicated to you guys. Um, so I'll hand it back over to Scott. So we can get into, <laughs> we get into a variety of, of kind of literary and cultural aspects about historical ideals of chivalry. But I'd really rather kind of work on this from more of a personal perspective. Because I've been doing these uh, presentations of, of deeds of arms like we did uh, out in the courtyard today. How many people were out there watching us? Oh, good, lots of hands. Excellent, good, um, good which is good because um, because what I'd like to do is give you a little bit more of a personal observation of some of the applications of ideals of chivalry that I've come to understand by what we're doing uh, out there and the insights that, that maybe we've gained from that um, that have kind of crept into our lives, and then maybe we can we can give a little bit of uh, a little bit of perspective of how taking part in these sorts of activities uh, would have helped to strengthen or clarify uh, the ideals of chivalry to 
knights historically who took part in them, uh, and can help us today to understand how those ideals might apply to us in stressful, competitive, difficult situations that we might find ourselves in, uh, wondering just exactly how do the ideals of honor help, uh, help to guide us through those challenging moments that we find ourselves in. Uh, first, though, although it looks like almost everyone made it for the deed of arms, we'll have a little, we'll have a review then. We'll call it a review. Um, we'll just show you guys a little video of an exchange uh, between Scott and another student, my husband, Christopher. Um, nope, nope, come back. How do I make it play? Uh, so, <laughs> sim, <laughs> sim, I don't uh, know iPads. This, this non-medieval technology. Um, <laughs> simply, <laughs> simply to make the point. Although, for the again, for those of you who saw it out in the courtyard, this is going to be nothing surprising. But simply to make the point that uh, a contest between two knights in armor is a little different than what you might have seen in historical movies or at Renaissance fair fighting shows. So there you'll notice an exchange with pole axes, and as one knight it takes the other to the ground, the fight continues on the ground until somebody yields. Right? Again, a little different from uh, just kind of swinging weapons at each other and lots of gymnastics and, and uh, uh, you know, spinning and, and uh, that kind of thing. Um, so let me just start with a little bit of a review then of historically, what was a deed of arms? When did this kind of contest uh, when would it have taken place, uh, and, and what kind of does that help us to understand what it would have meant uh, in this sort of encounter? So, uh, f first of all, um, a, when we say a deed of arms, that was a particular type of contest. It was not quite a tournament, not quite just a sporting, uh, a sporting exhibition like a jousting match, not quite that, and not quite a duel, not quite as serious or even potentially deadly as, uh, as, a, as a duel over some dis dispute or disagreement, kind of in between. Um, there, was, there was certainly uh, a degree of danger that, yes, d d a degree of danger and personal risk that would have been involved. Um, we said today that the type, of, uh, the type of deed of arms that we were kind of putting on would have fallen into the category that they would have called a plaisance, or a deed, a deed of pleasure, a deed of friendship. Would have been done with blunted weapons, um, and probably would have been done just to a, a certain number of counted blows, and then the match would have been ended. That would be in contrast to a, uh, a deed of arms done a outrance, uh, to the utmost, or a deed of war that would have been done with, with sharp weapons uh, and where the understanding of the, a, a risk of, of real and, and you know, immediate personal danger and possibly even death was part of the match. It doesn't mean that a deed a plaisance was totally safe. Uh, they were still fighting with steel weapons uh, and still uh, injury and even possibly death was part of the risk that they were taking. And understanding that that risk was part of the event was an important part for the audience, for the judges to, to understand what, what they were seeing, and an important part for the knights that were taking part in it because, uh, because being willing to take that risk uh, was part of their demonstration of the, uh, their ideals of boldness and courage uh, that was expected to take part. A deed a outrance, uh, a deed of war, was not necessarily a hostile match. Two friends could very well have been taking part in that. <laughs> I keep threatening Lorene that so one of these days, one of these days, when I'm ready to retire, we're going to get sharp weapons and we're going to fight a deed a outrance. <laughs> I don't think she believes me on that. <laughs> uh, so it was not necessarily a belligerent or, or, a, or a hostile match. Could very well have been done in a friendly environment, but knowing that the weapons that they were fighting with were live in that sense increased the, pre increased the danger and thus increased the prestige of taking part in that deed. And you know that's entirely true of what we do and what you guys saw here today. Um, what we do, it's not play acting, nothing is choreographed, um, we haven't predetermined anything of, oh, when you do this, I'm going to do that. Oh, no. Each of us is using every bit of skill and technique that we have available at our disposal to win. 
Because at the end of the day, we want to bring our best fight. We want to do our best. And it's always kind of nice when at the end of the day, you can go, oh, yeah, I, I won. That was kind of great. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean. <laughs> good job. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, we said, we said today that uh, a deed of arms was a kind of contest that would have been held on particular occasions when a showcase for skill and honor was necessary. I used the example earlier of when, a, uh, when an army might have, been summoned, uh, might have been summoned to go on campaign and a deed of arms might have been used to select which of the commanders was going to be given the honor of leading the charge or commanding various units of the army. Uh, so a deed of arms might have been used uh, to, to select the commanders. It would certainly be, have been important in such a case since when they said somebody was going to lead in war, they didn't mean that they were going to sit back behind the lines and tell other people where to go. It meant that they were going to be in front in the charge, and you better be a pretty good fighter if you're going to do that. So skill certainly would have been necessary, an important thing to, uh, to showcase, but also a sense of, of honor and chivalry. In this case, particularly trustworthiness, um, since, uh, since this is all a, a matter of personal honor, you better be sure that the per people you're putting in command of your army are people that you can trust not to take a payoff uh, from the enemy to uh, maybe be a little late to the battle, maybe it took a little longer to put on our armor than we thought, and oh, sorry, we didn't make it onto the battlefield. Um, so uh, honorable behavior and skill at arms, important, uh, important aspects of a deed of arms. More often, however, uh, we find in the 14th and 15th centuries, deeds of arms being held, ironically enough, at times when a truce or a peace was negotiated. Every medieval army traveled with ambassadors and diplomats that before the armies mustered and got ready for battle would meet and negotiate and see if the terms of a truce could be uh, could be uh, brought uh, brought about uh, if there was any need uh, if, or if possible that we could avoid battle. Um, in such a case, if a if a truce was negotiated, it was not uncommon at all for then for that to be celebrated, if you will, by holding a deed of arms between knights on the opposing side. Crazy as this sounds, and we'll talk uh, in a moment a little bit more about this. But crazy as it sounds, getting soldiers that were that that are enemies that are on, from opposing sides in the army and letting them attack each other with swords is a way of cementing peace. Hmm. That seems a little odd. Um, but uh, as I said, uh, uh, in, in, or in, 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 in the case of, of, um, of uh, a negotiated truce or peace, a deed of arms was often held in that environment. Oh, uh, and 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 as as we also made the point, important to recognize that this, like I said, this was not just a sports match. This was not about putting points on the scoreboard. Uh, it would have been uh, uh, an event where there would have been judges, there would have been lords and ladies uh, overseeing the event and choosing the winner uh, at the end of the deed of arms based on skill and chivalry. And very often, it was not uncommon at all. For the loser, the loser in quotes, now that you can see my fingers, the loser uh, of the match to be chosen the winner by the judges because they were trying more difficult techniques. They were putting themselves more in harm's way. They were, they were, uh, they were uh, trying uh, to, to win uh, by, uh, by more risky or more difficult techniques rather than just taking a safe, uh, a safe road to victory. Okay? So, Again, that sort of that notion of taking a personal risk, very important uh, to, uh, to so as something that would have been demonstrated in a deed of arms. So uh, with that in mind, um, I think what I'd like to do is just compare some notes here between Loreen and I about some of the things that we've learned by doing our deed of arms, recognizing that what we're doing here is th the stakes are far lower than there would have been in something of, of a medieval deed of arms. But still, I have found that uh, in doing this, um, I get a little bit. I get a little bit of insight, perhaps a little bit of understanding of what might have been going through those medieval knights' minds, uh, what they might be trying to tell us a little bit about living a life of honor by what they would have, what they would have done, and the ideals that they would have had on display in their deeds of arms. Good. So one of the things that I think uh, we that when we started out this. Uh, 
this program. I did not give much thought to, but it has kind of come to the forefront of my mind a little bit as we've been going on, is the fact that in every deed of arms, uh, historically and in ours, um, the, the competition, the contest is done with matched weapons. Both combatants are given equal weapons uh, and are expected to, and are to, expected to fight to, to contest with those. Um, it's, uh, it's something that's a little outside the, the modern mindset, perhaps, um, where, am I, am I stepping on your toes, Lorraine? Okay. Um, um, uh, historically, uh, this would have been done in, in both in foot combat or in a, in a mounted joust. Uh, in foot combat, often the combatants were given spear, sword, and dagger of equal length, uh, in equal, equal design, and expected to step into the lists, the, the gates are closed, and boom, go. Um, it was not a case where you got to choose your best weapon, and I'm going to choose my best weapon, and we're going we're gonna to see who's superior. That's a little bit more of kind of a modern, uh, modern mentality or a modern approach uh, to, to a contest. Um, uh, in, in, a, in a mounted jousting match, uh, they would have been given lances of exactly, down to the millimeter, uh, equal length, um, and expected to, uh, and expected to uh, joust with those. Uh, it, was not, it was not a matter of seeing who could hold the longest lance um, and, and win by getting a material advantage, uh, but, but using, again, equal matched weapons in a contest. So first, I'd like you to kind of consider this. Um, while Adid of Arms did play an extremely ro important role in medieval society, um, one of the primary reasons they did it is because it was fun. Um, they liked to go out and have their, their skills challenged. They liked to see what they were capable of. Um, and it's kind of nice to do it in, while it's a risky environment, it is a relatively low risk environment compared to, say, a war. Um, so why do this? Um, a lot of you guys are currently mo involved in modern, modern sports, in modern activities, in modern competitions, because it's just, it's plain and simple, it's fun. We like the challenge. Um, do, as a good example, do I have anyone in here who's into video games or these gentlemen? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, there's a game that's it's notorious for just making people want to cry. Um, it's Dark Souls 3. People play it. Yep, yep, I see the cringing. <laughs> um, you know, it has resulted in many a broken controller in this world, but people still play it. Oh my goodness, why would they do that? Well, eventually what happens is you start to get good at the game, right? You can keep playing the game over and over. You go through the, the game again. You have all the equipment that you've earned. And it starts to get a little easier. You know where the secret stuff is. And eventually, though, eventually you stop playing because it gets boring because you've done it so many times. You know all the secrets. You want a new challenge. You want something else to look forward to. And that's kind of what these knights were looking at is they were going, you know what? I want to be challenged because if I'm not, it's just kind of, eh. It's, what's the point? It's not fun anymore. Yeah, it's important to recognize that, um, you know, as I often say about living by the, by code of honor, it didn't mean that they were idiots. It didn't mean that they were stupid. And they recognized that there was a difference between what you would do in a deed of arms and what you'd do in potentially a real life and death situation. If you get jumped by a mugger in a dark alley, you're not going to hand them a weapon so they, oh, let, let's have even matched weapons, right? Um, they, they recognize that in a, in a life or death situation, yes, you take every advantage that you possibly can. Um, they, they would certainly have recognized that in war, if you outnumber your opponent, you do not hold back and allow for an even fight on the battlefield. Um, but in, in a contest like this where your goal is to show your skill and potentially even to put yourself at a disadvantage, um, that, uh, that matched weapon scenario uh, kind of allows you to, to showcase your willingness to put yourself at a disadvantage, to not fight with your best weapon, and potentially even to fight with a weapon that often your opponent is far superior with than you are, like when we're fighting with spears, um, and, uh, uh, and, and take on that challenge of, uh, of fighting with on an even, on a level playing field, um, rather than trying to find a material advantage for yourself. There's a lesson here that I think those, modern, the, the, those, those historical knights were trying to tell us in the modern world. And it's simply this. In life, when you go into battle, you don't always get to choose the weapon that you're fighting with, as it were. 
um, you may find that you are fighting sometimes with a weapon that you prefer, but you may find sometimes you're fighting at a disadvantage. You may find that sometimes you are fighting with something that advantages someone else. Um, and rather than uh, make excuses, rather than trying to look for a material advantage, it's far better to be ready to be creative and adaptable and be able to work with whatever tools you find yourself having to work with in a, in a difficult situation and do the best that you can do. Um, f that is much more of a, of a sense of honorable behavior than to, than to lose because you're not fighting with the tool that you want to fight with and use that as an excuse for falling short. that I discovered when I put on armor for the first time is a lesson about how ironically fighting with someone allows you to learn to trust them. Um, Scott talked earlier about, well, we all talked earlier about how a deed of arm, it involves a certain element of risk. Um, well, the same is true of ours. Um, make no mistake, though, we do our best to keep things safe. Um, you know, we have blunted swords. We wear helmets. Um, you'll notice that uh, we had our perforated visors instead of the historical ones because that historical visor, that'll go right through and stab you in the eye. Um, we don't want that. Um, you know, and, and we want our audiences to get a demonstration of medieval sword fighting and not necessarily a demonstration of our current emergency medical teams. <laughs> um, so, but the difference here between what we're doing in a real fight is literally the blunt end of a weapon. And without that, we would be fighting each other with lethal intent. So it's a rather encounter, it's a rather counterintuitive lesson here. Taking part in armored combat like we do, it teaches you to trust your opponent. Um, when you're both coming out into the field and realizing that, oh, hey, you know what? You could kill me right now with what we're doing. Um, it builds a sense of trust that you you just don't get with anyone else. Yeah, we certainly uh, have found that even when we even when we encounter people from other schools, from other groups, as we uh, go to uh, as we go to uh, workshops and and gatherings across the country, very quickly you learn to trust the the people that you're working with. Um, you respect the effort and the training that they have put into their art, as they respect you. Um, and recognize that there are, there are limits there, there are limitations in what you're trying to do. And that's not just, that's not just something that you're going to try to push the envelope so that you can get a win. Um, there's a recognition that we are literally putting our lives in each other's hands when we do this. And I've heard professional jousters say the same thing, that they recognize that when they mount up uh, and, and when they do a jousting match, that uh, you know, th their safety, literally their lives, are in their opponent's hands. Um, and if there's, not, a, if there's not, not an equivalent sense of trust and respect along with that sense of competitiveness and desire to win, if those two don't go hand in hand, things can go wrong very quickly. In either direction, if either one of those, uh, if either one of those factors is kind of taken to an extreme, either it's not a very fun competition, or you're going to be calling the ambulance real, real quickly, right? Um, so uh, I can certainly see, from the perspective of medieval knights having negotiated a truce or a peace, stepping onto the field with somebody who moments ago was an enemy but who you know has put the same level of effort and, uh, and, and focus and training into their skill that you have put into yours, stepping into, a, into the field of a deed of arms uh, and crossing swords with them uh, would certainly strengthen that sense of trust, of respect, of turning an enemy into, if not a friend, although that certainly did happen, uh, at least a colleague. Uh, at least somebody who is uh, a comrade, a brother in arms, um, could very easily, uh, in that in that way, be a way to strengthen a, a truce, uh, to make sure that the terms negotiated to cease hostilities were observed by all sides. And I think that's a pretty a pretty wise, a pretty bright way of uh, using the opportunity of taking the tools of war 
and turning them into an opportunity for peace. You know, and that's, it's, it's funny because it's, it's very similar today as it was then, and that it's, it's a fairly small community of people who get to do this. Um, you know, like we discussed earlier, armor was incredibly expensive. The training was expensive. If you developed a reputation back then, even, for being dishonorable, for being untruthful, for cheating, no one was going to play with you. And that's very true even today. Um, you know, and we talk about using these, these we talk about using these events to build bridges. And this is just very similar to, you know, even our modern Olympics. We use that spirit of competition. Yes, I'm competing. Yes, I want to win. But it tends to build bridges. What it does for us is it creates a spirit of togetherness because we're all here with one idea, which is to enjoy ourselves and to have a good time. And in that regard, I, you know, I think that the Olympics are a great example of the same sort of spirit that we're talking about with a deed of arms. You know, we can talk about all sorts of manner of sports and competitions and championships uh, and whatever, but the Olympics is always set off as a little bit different, a little bit of more of a, of a sense of getting together in that spirit of competition, but also unity and, and camaraderie, um, much like I'm sure that knights taking part in a deed of arms would have felt together. Exactly. Um, so something that I learned um, from this particular sport, um, let's talk a little bit about failure. <laughs> um, when I started fighting, I was terrible. I was really, really, really bad at this. Um, you know, Scott would say, oh, go to Ox on your left. I'd go, I'd do it on my right. He'd say, wind. I would do something completely different. Um, I can't tell you how many times he looked at me at the end of explaining something for like the first six months and said, yeah, does that make sense? And I go, yeah. He go, you look confused. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I started to think I had resting confused face. Um, I really did. And, you know, Scott wasn't really aware of this at the time, but there were moments when I just kind of wanted to cry because I was so frustrated with it. I was like, what am I doing? But the beauty of that is I kind of realized it didn't matter. It was okay to be bad at this. Um, I'm like a real knight. And at the time, it didn't matter. It was okay for me to be bad at it. And I think it's something that a lot of people never get to experience that, oh, I, it's okay, I'm bad at this, I stink at this, but this has no real world translation at all at the time. <laughs> now a little bit I need to be pretty good at it. Um, but, you know, I did improve, thankfully. Um, but I, I, that lesson of failure of was okay, it really stuck with me. Um, and I didn't just learn that it's okay to fail, but I also learned that how to fail. So when we fell in this game. <laughs> as, as you noticed a little bit today yes. when, when Lorene put me on the ground. Yes, so when you fell, you are stabbed, you are thrown to the ground, you are beamed in the head with a pole axe, um, and all sorts of fun things. And then people like yourselves are very kind and post them on social media <laughs> and tag you in it and say hashtag chivalry today. <laughs> but, it's, it's one of those things where it's, there's two really beautiful things about this. The first of which is that this is our safe space to fail. This is the irony here. This is our safe space. Oh yes, it's great, it's safe, I'm being hit in the head with a pole axe. Eh, okay, <laughs> um, stick with me. But the first reason is, is because it's, our opponents are usually the first people to pick us back up. Um, these photos are from a deed of arms we had in Kansas City. Uh, the one on the bottom right is from one that we had here. Um, every single one of these guys, and ladies, sorry, the one on the top left is a lady, um, every single one of them shook hands at the end of the deed, every single one of them hugged after that, and like I said, they're the first person to help you get back up. Um, so it does help to create those bonds. Um, second, you know, these small failures, they have small consequences. So taking a hit with a blood sword, yeah, it hurts, I got a bruise, but I'm okay. I'm not injured, right? But what that does is it teaches us resiliency that we can put later, that we can later put to use when we get those, when we hit those catastrophic events, catastrophic 
personal events. So when a job loss comes or when you lose a family member, it helps you to build that up and teaches you how to get back up. So the thing about our society is we love to talk about you know, our successes. We don't, we don't really talk to, like to talk about failure so much. Um, partly because there's a bit of a shame felt there. But, you know, there is something good in that. If we can learn to set our pride aside and accept the failure, if we can learn to do that instead of ignoring it or denying it, oh, well, I slipped. That's the only reason that you were able to take me down, Scott. Uh, or I can say, you know what? He took me down because that was a textbook takedown that was excellent, and I need to work on how to respond to that. I can, I can learn to reverse that throw. Um, but you first, you have to accept the failure. You have to say, yeah. So it is an opportunity for us to improve. Um, and, you know, it sounds kind of like, you know, kind of a small world application. You know, none of us are going to come out and with sharp swords and try to attack each other. I hope. <laughs> um, but it does have real world implications. Um, you know, when I started college, we were talking a lot about um, the, a lot of the experiments that get published. Um, most of the f experiments that fail do not get published. And we go, oh, well, why would you publish that? Like, it's, it failed. It didn't work. Why do we care? Because what happens is we spend millions and possibly billions of dollars every year redoing experiments that failed because we didn't know some guy across the country tried it. So instead of, OK, oh, that guy tried that. OK, great, and it failed. OK, that kind of stinks. Well, what if we tried it doing this? It kind of it cuts down on our ability to communicate. So it's really important that we're able to say, hey, it didn't work out so well. And then the last point I kind of want to make on failure in this practice is it also teaches us to reframe that failure. Instead of going, oh, god, I suck. Look at me. Like, I'm flat on my back. Like, oh, how embarrassing. Instead, it teaches us to reframe it like, hey, that was a great back lever throw. Like, you, you kind of learn to celebrate your opponent's wins instead of dwelling in your losses. And I think that very much, you know, kind of speaks to that sense of humility that knights were expected to have. To know that no matter how good you are, hey, there's always someone out there that's better. Um, no matter how fast you are, there's always some, someone who's going to beat you in a, in a contest one of these days. Um, like Lorene says, don't take that as a mark of shame. Celebrate them for their for their victory, for their skills, uh, and recognize that uh, they just gave you a very valuable lesson in something you need to improve. So um, I get a lot of questions about women in armor. Um, to start with, uh, I do want to emphasize, women did historically wear armor. Um, a few famous examples up here of women in armor. Uh, Joanna of Flanders, uh, she successfully defended, uh, her husband was off at war, she successfully defended her castle um, against invaders. She actually led, put on armor, and led her men out in an attack against the enemy. Um, we also have Elizabeth I of England. Uh, while she did not fight in armor, because she was a queen, um, she certainly did wear it when she would address her troops and make military decisions. Da, da, da. And then, of course, the most famous is, of course, Joan of Arc, um, which everyone knows. But it's, it's important to know that for every woman in armor and every woman posing in armor, that there were thousands and thousands of knights. So it's not to say that, like, oh, yeah, women wore armor all the time. No, 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 they did not. But it did happen. Um, so. A lot of people ask me what it's like to be a woman fighting in armor. Um, but what's really excellent and what I really love about what we do is I don't really have an answer to that. Um, because it's really similar to being a guy fighting in armor. Um, there's an accomplished HEMA fighter, historical European martial artist, um, by the name of Jessica Finley. Um, and she calls armor the great equalizer. And it's exactly that. Um, it makes it so. I can do just about everything that he can do. Um, there is no women league, female league of armored fighting. Um, and I really, I've not experienced anything in this community except for a warm welcome to a newcomer um, and a very inclusive attitude. And I think a lot of that comes from back to that concept of fighting on a le level playing field. I'm wearing the exact same equipment that he is. 
Um, it's the same. Uh, you know, we use the same weapons. We use the same length of weapons. We use the same weight of weapons. It's all the same. So we're on an equal fighting field. And it's sort of the same that's true for men. Um, you know, even for men, the victory conditions are the same. And there will always be someone who's bigger and stronger than you to fight. Yes, uh, certain fighters could definitely come in and pick me up and throw me. But if you can pick up me in, you know, 60 pounds of armor plus my body weight and throw me, you can certainly do that to many men out there. Um, so it really doesn't, it doesn't affect me in that way. And it's, it's a really wonderful for community, community for that reason. Um, also, I wanted to make, I keep doing that. Sorry, guys. Also, I wanted to make a quick note um, about women's armor. There's not really, unlike video games and fantasy novels that'll have you believe, like that, you know, oh, there's like special armor for women, like it was more stylish, or you've seen like the, the weird like bra armor thing. No, <laughs> there's no difference between men's armor and women's armor. Um, it's exactly the same. Um, in fact, that's a particular reason that I love this painting by Ang, who's a 19th century painter, is because Joan of Arc is wearing men's armor, and that's actually a pretty accurate representation of armor. Um, so good job, Ang. <laughs> and, and you'll notice Joanna Flanders, if you look at armor uh, from the same period, pretty much exactly what male knights would have been wearing at the time. And I love that uh, illustration of Elizabeth because, boy, that cuirass that she is wearing is almost identical to one that's on display in the gallery. If you walk through there, there's a alanteca, a, his, a heroic style of armor. Looks like it's got scales etched into it. Man, it is similar to that armor that she's wearing. Moving on. One last uh, point I want to make about uh, chivalry that to me is particularly meaningful um, that goes back not to the Middle Ages, but to a early 20th century author, C.S. Lewis. Uh, author of the Chronicles of Narnia uh, and a variety of other works, essays, short stories, novels, um, and something of a scholar of Arthurian literature and chivalry himself. Um, he wrote an essay in 1940 called The Necessity of Chivalry. As England was looking at entering into World War II and things were looking a little grim throughout the European theater, and people were starting to wonder if the young men of England at the time had what it took to take part in another great war. Uh, and he wrote a uh, very meaningful essay, essentially making the case that because of their deeply rooted understanding of chivalry, that even that young English gentlemen did in fact have the, uh, the ideals and the strength of character that would have been necessary to succeed in battle. And he particularly observed uh, that the code of chivalry uh, is, uh, is a strong code of honor specifically because it has a tendency to bring together things that do not naturally gravitate toward one another. He used a quote from Arthurian legend to illustrate this, where Lancelot, the greatest of the Arthurian knights, was described as the sternest foe to ever put a lance in the rest and the meekest knight ever to eat in hall with ladies. And he recognized that, that the combination of ferocity and meekness are exactly what the code of chivalry teaches you to bring together, uh, that you can be in polite uh, society and, and, uh, and good company, you can be kind and gentle and charitable and humble, but when called upon to go to battle, you can be strong and bold and, and ferocious. And it's not a compromise between those two. Chivalry teaches you that it's okay to go to the extremes, that, that you can be kind and gentle as, as necessary, uh, and that you can be ferocious and, uh, and, and brave to the extreme. Uh, that, that bringing those elements together uh, is exactly what the code of chivalry is meant to do. And specifically, beep, specifically, uh, he said also that, um, that this is not something that happens naturally. That, it, that in order to live by the code of chivalry, you must make a deliberate choice uh, to, to strive to meet those ideals. He said that it literally uh, makes a, a living work of art out of a person uh, and creates, uh, creates a, a work of art uh, not of marble and, and canvas, but of, of 
flesh and blood out of a, out of a human being in order to try to live by the code of chivalry. I find that that is particularly true and that what, as, as Lorene said when we started out, uh, that uh, our understanding of that concept of chivalry today often kind of just boils down to little acts of kindness and good manners. But in fact, that's where chivalry starts. That's where having a, a code of honor, a code of ethics that you follow start. Looking around for little things, little acts of kindness and courtesy that you can do every day. It breaks you out of that me first mentality and puts you in the mindset of what can I do for someone else? As I travel through my daily life, what is it I can do to make someone else's life a little more pleasant? Uh, what can I do to reach out to help somebody else? Not when there are great battles to be fought or great quests to be pursued, but just when there is a little act of kindness that needs to be done. Uh, and so those little courtesies, those little acts of good manners that we think of as chivalry today are those uh, are, are the, the, the building blocks that C.S. Lewis would have said uh, are, are turning, turning someone into literally a, a work of, of human art. Okay? I think today, I think today, it would behoove us all to think a little bit about the, that bringing together of things that do, not naturally, uh, that do not naturally gravitate toward one another. We have a lot of conflict and belligerence in our world today, and I think that con contemplating the lessons that we take away from a deed of arms, both as the participants and the audience, might help us to understand how the ideals of chivalry help us to treat other people with respect even in a very competitive environment, uh, even when someone is literally trying to attack us with, with deadly weapons, uh, and to treat them with respect and honor, um, knowing that uh, we can work together with people that we would not nat naturally gravitate toward, but still have that sense of chivalry allowing us to come together um, to treat one another respectfully and honorably. Um, and that's a way that I think that we can still uh, take that take that sense of, of chivalry, of the code of, of honor that was created by those knights who, who lived in a time when these beautiful works of art that we see on display in the gallery um, were not sitting behind glass, were not up on a shelf, but were out in the world being used by champions and heroes that walked, uh, that walked the earth um, that reminded us that uh, chivalry is not something that needs to be uh, that needs to be thought of as just a fantasy or a literary ideal, but that can be put to work in, in our daily lives every day. Um, and, and we can still live up to those ideals from the days of knights of old and the armor that they left us that, that's on display in the gallery here. Hope that helps a little bit to understand what the ideals of chivalry are all about and how they can be put to work uh, in today's world. Um, thank you for your attention, and I hope that we have a few minutes for some questions here. Um, whether it's about the ideals of chivalry or arms and armor, we're happy to, we're happy to answer them. So thank you very much for your attention.